Welcome back to The Chosen Life. I'm your host, The Chosen Lawyer, and back with us as always, our resident sports expert, great all-around guy, Mr. Wayne Frazier, Jr. of Doug Laurie Sports. Wayne, welcome back. Good morning, John. Glad to be here again on this uh, rather balmy Wednesday morning here. My gosh. I was thinking the same thing as I was walking my dog before this episode. I think, wow, it's, and I actually thought the same word. It's a balmy plus 10. I actually get to wear a hoodie outside. It's incredible. And I want to point out, this is the big difference between John and I. John does stuff that counts in life before the podcast, before we, we tape the podcast. Whereas I roll out of bed, have a shower, go get a cup of coffee and come straight here. And this is the first thing I do in the morning that we do the podcast other than read a little bit. Right. So. Well, I appreciate that very much, Wayne. When my uh, book is released in the fall, uh, going to uh, hopefully uh, encourage people to uh, build for themselves life systems and get the most of the life that they can. In most days I've probably gotten most more done by the time most people have woken up in the morning throughout, like, you know, for, for their whole day. It's uh, it's just a habit that I've learned later on in life. And it's a bit of a struggle, a lot of days getting out of bed, but once I'm out, I'm off to the races. That's how I feel. Now, have you, uh, speaking of the book and kind of developing those things, have you spoken with military guys who kind of, I mean, would you say that your, your system and kind of the way you do things now, trying to get things done early in the day and having a system like that, have you talked with military guys who kind of find that the military runs in the same fashion to a certain extent? Because I find that with guys that I deal with who are military guys that they're always up early. They're always like pretty much first thing in the morning, they're getting crap done right off the bat. Right. And when I talk to them later in the evening, they seem way more relaxed than everybody else. Cause there's not a lot of, I mean, I don't want to say that the military isn't stressful, but the guys who are in the military and who have left maybe they kind of have that structure to their lives. And like, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. And then it takes it off the table for you. Right. Well, not to give too much of a sneak preview, but uh, getting things done early in the morning is a very, very small, minute part of this systems. There's much more to the systems than that. Right. But in, it's not going to be just military way. And, you know, if you look at uh, most business leaders, successful politicians, they all share that same trait. They're up early in the morning. They get the workout in. They get their breakfast in, read the news. They've gotten so much done by 9 a.m. It's incredible. So... That's the thing that I, I noticed when I read different people's autobiographies, read stories, read articles, uh, magazine uh, uh, exposés, you know, and uh, I started noticing really successful people have this thing in common. And it's not just to wake up in the morning. It's an overall life system routine. So stay tuned. More details to come on the book and how to build those life systems and be the best one that one can be. Cool. Uh Question for you before we begin. I see this lovely jersey behind you. This is new. Uh, what year Vancouver Canucks team signed ter- jersey do you have there? So I haven't done the autograph map yet, but it does have both the Sedin brothers and Luongo on it. And I'm hoping that it's the year that they went to the cup, but I'm not 100% sure yet. It's somewhere in that vicinity, but I I, I believe it's you know, maybe 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. How does one acquire a signed Vancouver Canucks team jersey, not knowing which exact year it is? How did this jersey come into your possession? The way most things come into my possession, which is either they walk into the store blindly or somebody calls me and says, "Um, hey, you know, I've got this. And and either I I don't know what it is and can you help me out with it? Or I do know what it is and I want to, you know, I just don't have any use for it anymore. I suspect that this one was actually purchased at a thrift store uh, would be my guess. I do have uh, one of the things that you deal with in my business is uh, it's both positive and negative. Um, The positive side of it is if you're familiar with just junk or these places that go in and do clean outs, anytime I see those guys on the side of the road, I pull over and hand them my business card and say, whatever you find in there, whether it's cards, autographs, toys, records, uh, antiques, and and I'm not a a coin stamps. I'm not an expert in all of those things by any stretch of the imagination, but if I don't know what it is, I know somebody who does know who and what it is. And I tell those guys, I don't care how bad you think it is, bring it to the store, 
The worst I can say is no, and I'm going to give you five bucks and throw it in the garbage out back for you, and you can buy a couple of coffees, right? But the, some of the things that get thrown out or when they do house cleanouts that are left behind are, are amazing, right? And guys come in thinking they're going to get 20 bucks and they end up getting a thousand, right? For, you know, autograph pieces or things along those lines. Um, I also have people who are uh, sort of low level pickers in the sense that they will hit all the value villages and things like that. Now, you know, I tell the stores like Talese and places like that, if you get something in that you don't know about, call me. Because at the very least, I'll give you the information. And in most instances, I'll buy it, right? And then I'll do the authentication or I'll have to go through whatever process after the fact. Um, but the things that just kind of come out of nowhere, uh, I'm working right now on, and I don't know whether I'm going to really be of any help in this, but I have a gentleman who's contacted me who has a gold medal from the 1936 Berlin Olympics with an incredible backstory uh, for the person who who actually won the medal. Uh, I estimate that the value is somewhere between 30 and 40,000 US. Um, the best place for it is an auction house, a large auction house. And so I'm just working with, you know, trying to help the guy out right now. And if I can facilitate, facilitate the deal, great. And if I can't, well, then I learned something really amazing. And I'll, once, once either I'm involved in the deal and done with it or whether I'm, when I'm out, then the next time we talk, I'll actually share it with you. It is, it is pretty fascinating. Uh, the, the downside is people walk in all the time with just absolute junk that they think is worth a million dollars. And I get all these people who then do the same thing and they don't know what they're doing. And they go and buy things at, at wherever value village or resource store or whatever, a garage sale. And they pay $30 for a box full of nineties basketball or football cards that are worth about five bucks and get mad at me when I won't make the profit for them. And I'm like, look, I appreciate you making the attempt, um, but this is not the kind of stuff you should buying or they come in and want me to price everything for them so that they can go sell it on eBay themselves. I do offer appraisal services generally for insurance purposes. My fee is a hundred dollars an hour and that is cheap for what I know and what I can provide comparative to other services. And I hate doing it. I, I try not to do it at all. You know, if you're, if you're interested in selling me something, bring it to me, I'll make you an offer. And if it's a single something or other, I just had somebody contact me. It was a beautiful Gretzky rookie. And, you know, nine out of 10 times when people say, Oh, I have a really nice one. It's a reprint or a fake or whatever else. This one isn't, am I going to get anything out of this deal? Unless the people are nice, probably not. I want to flip me a hundred bucks later on. I think the card will probably grade well enough where it will sell between six and eight thousand um, dollars. So you know, you you kind of have to look at everything, and unfortunately, you have to be the person in a lot of instances to tell people that the things that they have are either not worth as much as they thought, or they're counterfeit and they're not worth anything at all, and that that kind of sucks. But so Wayne, I'm very confused because last I heard during pandemic times. Didn't a Wayne Gretzky rookie sell in the millions? Yes, uh, there are, I believe, two now PSA 10 Gretzky OPG rookies, hmm. one of which is definitely not a 10. If you look at it inside the holder, you can see there's a little tick of uh, a paper on the top of it. But but anyway, I, don't, get on, don't get me on grading. Um, no, but, but this the, the one that you saw, what ballpark would you grade it at? And why is it only only six eight thousand $8,000? Uh, I would say it's it's probably going to be a PSA 7, which at one point was selling north of that. But the issue is, is that people don't realize there are lots of Gretzky rookies out there, tons, right? I mean, it wasn't a short print. It, it, there was nothing special about the card. It was just a regular card in the set. And there's a lot of 1979-80 Opeachy available on the market. What the distinction for Gretzky rookies and, and most vintage cards of any kind is the condition of the card. And so most Gretzky rookies are off center, either top to bottom. They have ragged cuts because the Opeachy company at the time used guillotine blades or wires and terrible, you know, and they don't generally hold that actually against when you find a Gretzky with a nice cut, actually a lot of times it's either been trimmed or it's a fake, right? Um, but this one appears to have very, very minimal uh, jagged edging the centering is good. I think it probably would be a seven. Now that card a year and a half ago might've sold for 10 to 15. 
But now people have realized that during the pandemic, when everybody went and pulled their cards back out and then the grading uh, craze took off, sevens are not that hard to find, right? They're not that difficult. And so when the scarcity goes down, so does the value, right? Uh, it's like all the basketball cards that people were grading that they thought were going to be worth millions of dollars. And then it turns out, well, there's 35,000 of them have been sent in for grading and 15,000 of them are PSA 10s. That means they're not that hard to get and they go way down, right? So if you know me well enough, as soon as I heard Wayne say that sevens are not that hard to find, you know what I'm thinking. So, uh, <laughs> but I can tell you, there's a lot of people sitting out there with Wayne Gretzky rookies when that, uh, when they sold in the millions and are thinking, oh, wow, I'm sitting on 2 million bucks here. Not going to ex- happen. That's exactly what happened. And then in the, in the aftermath of that sale, the immediate aftermath, I was flooded with people who then would come in and had a Gretzky that was basically stapled together after it being ripped in half. Well, this has got to be worth $20,000. Right. And I'm just like, dude, no. And that's, that was a, that was a, a really uncomfortable month or two because every other day somebody would leave mad at me. People would say, you're trying to rip me off. And I'm like, dude, I didn't even offer to buy the card. I'm just giving you information and your card is not worth very much. Unfortunately. Now they're still worth quite a bit more than they were three years ago because there's that whole investor market opened up people who weren't in hockey before to buy hockey. Right. Um, but it's just a lot of those guys got their money, made their flip and got out. And a lot of other guys that held on to the cards that should have sold the cards. And I always tell, you know, I tell people when you're at the, what you think is close to the peak of the market. I have a buddy who had a Beckett seven, which he probably could have sold for $12,000 us after buying it for 1500, 10 years ago. And he goes, I don't know if I want to sell it or not. Dude, sell the card. Even if it goes up to 15,000, right? Sell the card for 12,000 us, because in a year or two, it's going to be down to five or six and you could buy it back You can buy the exact same grade of the card and have five grand in your pocket and hung on to it, right? So funny, Wayne, you know, when it comes to real estate, it comes to sports cards, watches, cars, you know, the sheep like to buy when everybody's buying and they want to dump when everybody's dumping for some reason. They don't realize how the that should be flipped. The smart yeah. ones with the money know that and what they do is they bring a whole lot of cash when people are dumping and they are selling when everybody's buying that's how you make yeah. real money now you got me one thing fascinated as well before we get started on our topics today because we always to get off track there's always interesting things to discuss i love watching you know back in the day antique road show you know i remember when you, you know you had this one gentleman that brought this rare rolex with the original paperwork. Yep, and, I remember that episode. You know, that was a fantastic episode. He had every little detail down to T, kept all the uh, papers when he got it serviced by Rolex. It was just fascinating stuff, you know, and you see, you know, a guy had a Babe Ruth baseball sign. Let me ask you, has there been a Doug Laurie uh, antique roadshow type uh, scenario? And what is, I would say, either most expensive or most interesting intrinsic piece that ever came into your possession? We don't do, like, I don't set up and do the road show kind of thing because I'm here five days a week for people. And I I do, you know, I do make house calls when we buy estates or things like that. Um, Man, what is the nicest thing? Or most expensive or rare. I had the the opportunity to get involved with pieces of Bill Barocco's plane, um, which... Unfortunately, I was not able to help the gentleman out because it was just he just wanted too much money um, and was not really willing to listen to some of the thoughts that I had on what I thought would be best. Now, there is a there's a gentleman in Toronto who does own a, a fair number of pieces of that plane. And that's a very interesting story in and of itself. And sometime down the road, if you want to talk about it. But this guy just showed up out of the blue in the back of his truck uh, with and with Providence. A, a, a good record of here's why I have it and everything. Um, you know, aside from that, I would say the best story I can ever give you, and I'll make this as quick as I can. The first show I, when I was a kid, not a kid, basically a uh, 22, 23 years old. Um, I had my first store and uh, I put on my first card show. And of course 
I had a couple of other friends to help me so that I could set up at the show myself. And of course, being the promoter, I took the booths right inside the door. And my buddy who was helping me, an older, not older guy, but older than me, a banker, um, who had helped put up the money to, to secure the hall and everything, comes in and he's kind of white. He's just like really kind of pale looking. I'm like, what, what's the problem, John? And he's like, uh, this lady has some stuff she wants you to look at. And so it's an elderly woman. This is 1992 or 93. And she puts, you know, the old, almost like the Eaton shopping bags, but this is in St. Louis with the rope for the handle, right? From the sixties or whatever. And she pulls out some photo albums and they're the kind from like the sixties and seventies where you could stick the, fo the photo in and then lay the, you know, and I thought, oh, these are all going to be stuck together or whatever is in here. She opens them up and it's fifties baseball and they are unbelievable conditions, just beautiful. And, and I said, okay, ma'am. And, and she says, I guess her son collected them when he was young and he was killed in the Vietnam war. And she was selling her house and downsizing and I thought it was time to, to get rid of this stuff. Right. And I said, okay, the first page had three fifty four Williams or 55 Williams, beautiful just beautiful cards, you know, and uh, haven't seen the light of day in at that time, 30 something years. So I said, what are you thinking for all of the binders or the, the albums? There's nine of them in the three bags. And she says, well, I was hoping I could get $50 for each bag, but I guess if I got a hundred for everything, I would be happy. And I said, okay, I, I want you to come back here and sit behind the table with me. And I kind of went through everything with her. And at that time, I, I figured it was somewhere between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars worth of stuff at that time, right? And I said, I do not have the wherewithal to buy this from you, and I'm not going to give you a hundred dollars for it. I want you to go see this gentleman in St. Louis, and he's going to give you somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, my my friend cut me in a nice check. Uh, for helping him out, and the lady never did anything for me. <laughs> but that's probably the most, the like in terms of just like, wow, that's insane, you know, uh, just kind of walking, walking in and being dumped up. Now, if I end up doing, helping out with the deal with the gold medal, uh, that would be pretty significant and also. Um, and then, you know, I've been involved in, in large collections also, but I tend not to buy into the super high-end stuff it's just really not my market. I don't sell a lot of that stuff online. I, uh, I'm more of a digger. I like to buy stuff like in bulk and just kind of dig around and find, find gems. Right. Uh, any coolest, uh, championship rings you've ever almost got or did get or did sell or consigned. I once had a, uh, a, I was at a show, uh, set up next to Bobby Bond, um, uh, from the Leafs and Bobby and I spent a, a big part of the day talking about the possibility of him inciting one of his rings to me. Uh, we ended up not doing it. And I don't know whether Bobby ended up selling one or not. Um, my Because I'm all the way up here uh, in Barrie, like all the way up here, like I'm on the moon or something. Um, well, that's what Toronto people think. If you tell them he's there in Barrie, they're like, oh, I got to drive all the way to Barrie. Like, yeah, don't, it's, don't, it's, even, yeah. don't even worry what U.S. people would say. But, uh, <laughs> it's very far, folks. Where and you so are, more yeah, a whole, it's a whole forty-five minutes from turn from from the GTA to here, um, but a lot of that stuff gets sucked up by the big guys down in Toronto. And a shout out to Hirsch at Frozen Pond. Um, Hirsch does a lot of that stuff. Hirsch right now is helping the Howe brothers with a lot of Gordy's stuff, right? Um, and so I, I do see some of that stuff, but it's pretty unusual for me to see player items and that sort of thing. More more of what I'll see is. Uh, collections of people that are a little farther north um, that, you know, sometimes there's player stuff involved in that. Like I somehow ended up with some of John Tinelli stuff from the Islanders, right? You know, not that long ago. So occasionally that happens. But that uh, the Juto brothers at Classic Auctions about 15 or 20 years ago really, really kind of when they did John Beliveau's auctions and I actually did a, a signing with Mr. Beliveau while that was going on. And we had a long talk about it. Mark and Claude were really the first guys to jump in and say, hey, if you're a player, you should come through us and let us handle all your stuff. And now that's pretty much what happens to every player's stuff is they almost have a deal in place 
uh, at the time that they pass or the, the point that they're ready to go. And almost every auction now that Claude runs, or sorry, that Mark runs, Claude now runs a bear camp in Saskatchewan, I think. Uh, they always have a player stuff. I think they just did a bunch of Grant Fuhrers recently. And so it's really neat. You get to see kind of the inside scoop. And it's a good idea for the players because the players can then help in with the, be in the marketing of it, right? That was the great thing about Bellavo is he, you know, he said, I'm going to be gone before long. And here I am. I can help promote the auction and sign the LOAs and attest to the, the validity of everything, right? Um, so a lot of that kind of stuff goes directly to the big auction houses, which it, it should. That's where they're going to get the most money. And if, if a player came to me, like I have the wherewithal to sell at my own website, I can sell on eBay. So I can I can sell some pretty amazing stuff. Yes. But if you have a huge collection like that, really one of the big auction houses, if you're a player, it's probably the best, the best bet. And I would direct them that way. So I definitely tell the audience, check out Doug Laurie Sports. You have your online website, you got your auction house. And uh I do check out once in a while and do have interesting things, Wayne. Uh my one Gordy House story. I remember I was 14 years old and I uh, met him at a card convention and I said, uh, Mr. Howe. Can you please put down uh, your number nine uh, on the picture when you do your autograph? He wrote down nine and gave it back to me and <laughs> thought that was hilarious. Well, Gordy, I got the last <laughs> laugh at the end. <laughs> I have so, to, we had we had Gordy twice as a guest. I've had him twice. And at the I can't remember which signing it was, but we did a show uh, in conjunction with it. We used to do shows at Dave and Buster's at Vaughn and or maple or whatever that i don't know um and we had a guy at the show who was set up and a huge gordy howe fan and he had a jersey on but he just didn't have the money it was like 250 dollars to get a jersey signed right and so we took a break and i'm in the can and gordy comes in and he says he says hey wayne can i ask you something and i said sure and he says do you mind if i sign that kid's jersey and i said what Gordy, it's your arm. You can sign it. And he goes, well, you brought me in here and you're paying me. And I said, well, I appreciate you asking me as the promoter, but absolutely. He goes, okay, watch this. So we go over to the guy's booth and he says, hey, kid, turn around. So I give him a Sharpie and the guy turns around and he signs Mr. Hockey on the top of the nine and Gordy Howe and then Hall of Fame at the bottom, right? And he says, take it off. So he takes it off and he shows him and the guy, I think he's going to cry, right? He's just like, oh my gosh. And how looks him straight in the face and says, 250 bucks, kid. And the guy's just like, whoa. And he's like, I'm just screwing with you. Don't worry. I'm doing it for free, right? But he had such a good sense of humor. He was so nice. He ended up on the floor, like wrestling with a couple of kids at the end of the show and showing them the elbows and everything else. And this is when he was in his mid 70s. Like he was just, he was uh, all those guys. I don't think there's, probably one guy I can think of that played in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s that was kind of a dink to work with, and I will not share the name. But everybody else that I ever worked with from those eras was absolutely fantastic. And I do got to clarify, Gordy did end up signing the autograph at the end because <laughs> he literally was going to make me walk away with this number nine on on the picture, an 8 by 10 I'm like, you're signing it, buddy. I was trying to get actually irritated at <laughs> 14. The one guy who I would say out of all the sports athletes ever I've ever met in any sport, Wendell Clark, by far, nicest guy, never seen him turn down, one autograph request, saw him at a red light. Somebody ran to his window. He signed <laughs> coming out of supermarkets, wherever. If you find Wendell, Wendell will always sign. He's that kind of class act. I estimate there has to be like 10 million Wendell Clark autographs out there easily. So maybe as uh, rare as a Wayne Gretzky rookie. Getting to championships now, Wayne, we got to cover some very important topics today. First of all, I look pretty silly because I made some Super Bowl predictions, you know, and it didn't go out the way it, I thought it was going to be. Now, first of all, Wayne, I was really enjoying this year's NFL playoff season. I thought we had a lot of great games, a lot of twists and turns. Things mostly went the way they're supposed to. The one thing that did not go my way was Mr. Brock Purdy. You know, I really jumped firmly on the Brock Purdy bandwagon. I was driving his bandwagon all the way to the Super Bowl and him and Chaba Chuba going to be, you know, the best brother combo known to man. <laughs> Wayne, what happened to my boy Brock Purdy? I don't get it. I'm still in shock. He should have been in there facing 
the Chiefs and hosting the Lombardi Trophy. I'm I'm still crying in my cereal. Well, that game, you know the the injury. Uh, I I just that was horrible. I mean, it, it didn't look that bad in real time, and then when you saw the force of his arm going forward and and just I believe it's an ulnar rip, right? Now I think they said cool. they're not going to. Yeah, but they said they're they're not sur- it's not surgery. The, they're somehow it's they're going to put it in a brace or something like that. I, I maybe I AI is going to fix it. Yeah. I have no. I, <laughs> I I could be wrong about that. I but I I believe I read that it was just like they're going to brace it or something. Look, and the crazy thing is here here that you know we wants to get back in the game. I'm like, dude, your your arm doesn't work, right? You know, um, the crazy the kind of the funny thing about that game though is that when it was all over with and people, I, I, people were like, Oh, 31 to seven, blah, 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 or whatever the final was. I'm like, Hey, that game was seven, seven. And San Fran's defense had shut them down on two or three consecutive drives. And then they got called for four or five penalties in a row. Two of which was like, I, I mean, we can talk about the Eagles penalty in a bit in the Super Bowl, but two or three of those penalties were just non-existent penalties. And I thought, yeah, you can't blame the referees for a 31-7 to loss, but you can say that they dramatically changed the course of the game when you just kept giving them extra chances. You know, third down and eight, uh, defensive holding. Okay, the, the dude had two fingers on the guy's back. Like, give me a break. So... I, it really it irritated me. I, you know, it wasn't that I didn't expect Philadelphia to win that game, or it was going to be a toss up one way or the other. Just I don't, I don't like having to watch the referees make that much of an effect on the game. Right? I mean, I'm you not. Go, you go look at you go look at the Eagles' numbers in a 31 to seven win. You're thinking this was so dominant, and look at Jalen Hurts' numbers. If you don't see the final score, you would think this the 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 game may have gone in a totally different way. Like this is where when I when it came down to bet for the Super Bowl, my money was on the Chiefs, and I won it because guess mm-hmm. what? I saw the way they beat the Bengals, and I said they're going to do this exact same thing to the Eagles, which is exactly what happened. But in fairness, you know the way the 49ers were rolling, the way Purdy was rolling, he doesn't get that injury. They're your Super Bowl champions. I don't see how they weren't, or they would have been much closer. I think they had a much better chance than the Eagles against that Chiefs team. So I mean, it's it's a heartbreaking loss. To, you lose you lose him, then your fourth string quarterback gets injured, right? Jim Johnson, James Johnson, whoever would Josh Johnson, Josh he, Johnson, he, sure. You know, Josh Johnson, who has was, never was he a had, pitcher for the Marlins? He's ne- he was probably more effective as a pitcher for the Marlins. He, Josh the, Johnson is one of those guy. guys that Josh Johnson is one of those guys that they do not write his name in a story without well traveled placed in front of it. I, I think eight or nine different teams, and I, Josh Johnson's a a, a a fine athlete and everything, but I mean, you get down to that level, like my gosh! And when when you are almost in the Super Bowl, you're right there, and you got to bring in a quarterback that his name is on Velcro on the jersey. You know you're in trouble. <laughs> so I mean, just heartbreaking. And now I got to ask you, like, first of all. What is the future of Brock Purdy now? Like, uh, where is he headed? Like, as I, I, I don't think there's going to be anywhere but surgery. They can delay it all they want, but look at that injury and reading about the severity of it. I think it's inevitable, and you never know where people recover from those type of surgeries. So, first of all, where do you think his future lies? His immediate future and long term future? Well, this I'm just checking here to look. Oh no, they have set the surgery now for the 22nd. Are you on WebMD? Okay. Uh, uh, no, I'm looking at ESPN and just said so they, they have enough. decided. Yeah. They have decided now that they are going to do the surgery. So Thank initially you. they were talking about, Oh, there's going to put in a brace or whatever. And I'm like, you have a complete URL tear, tear. How in the world can you not? So anyway, they're, they're going to do it. They say he's going to be healed by the time they, it's a six month recovery and he'll be back in time for, uh, not for any of the OTAs, I don't think, or anything like that, but he should be ready to go by you know the preseason look the biggest problem is do i think that purdy will recover fully i actually do yeah i don't think there's any question about that my question is if you're the 49ers what the hell do you do in the offseason right because now 
You have Lance and Purdy both coming back from very serious injuries. Garoppolo's gone, right? You're gonna he's not gonna be part of the deal. What do you do? I mean, you I think if inside the if you were to ask inside the locker room and you were to ask the management of the 49ers, I think that they think going forward forward that Purdy is their guy, right? And that you just sam- you simply cannot put the the eggs in the Trey Lance basket because the basket never seems to make it more than two or three weeks without the eggs getting kicked out of it, right? So, but but how do you approach the season? Do you do you make a play for Derek Carr here and say that Pur- well look, do you think Purdy's ready to be the starting quarterback next year? I don't know, right? I don't know whether he's ready to be the starting quarterback. But if you feel like you've got a team that, hey, this team was in the championship game in the NFC this year, and if we go get Derek Carr, right, now Derek Carr is your starter for a year or two years or whatever else while Purdy either gets his strength back in his arm and or learns the game a little bit more, who says that Derek Carr can't take the 49ers to the Super Bowl next year? Uh, can you are you more confident with Derek Carr as your quarterback or Purdy or Lance? I, I think if I'm the 49ers and I have the opportunity to get Derek Carr or someone of that ilk or Aaron Rodgers, then I think you go get that guy and you just wait to see what happens, right? Wayne, if I was the team owner, which would be freaking awesome, or the GM, which would be <laughs> second awesome. First call, it would have been as soon as the season ended was to Tom Brady and say, Tom, before you make any announcements, please, we have the perfect setup for you, the perfect system, the perfect everything, the perfect weather. Your marriage is already in the toilet, buddy. Let's go over to San Francisco and let's give her one more run. You'd be perfect in the line of Joe Montana and Steve Young. You're going to love it here. And Brock Purdy is going to be your backup and let him recover slowly and we'll be all good. And we'll send Trey Lance to the Jets and figure that out. And Jimmy Garoppolo will go to back to New England and life will be good that way. I would be very happy with that as scenario one. Scenario two is Aaron Rodgers in his uh, darkness chamber that he's attending. The, you heard about the silent darkness yes. retreat? And he's going to go meditate on life. What's going to meditate? He's going to go back to Green Bay and make $50 million a year. There's nothing to meditate on there, Aaron. But he would have been a cool addition as well. Where I see them going in reality is going to be Brock Purdy and Trey Lance. I think Trey Lance is sleeping very well at night now, seeing that there's going to be an opening for him, which may have not been otherwise. And I can't see a world where Jimmy G's coming back with Trey Lance coming back. It's just not going to happen. Unfortunately, Jimmy did really well. I think he set himself up well for his next team. I don't know, Wayne, with the whole Derek Carr thing and the way he left the Raiders and they left him. Ah. I don't know. It's just a bad taste in my mouth. And if he comes in, but Brock's playing well, and then Derek's going to be a malcontent on the bench. I don't know. I don't know. I look at the situation with the Raiders as the Raiders have screwed every single per- possible personnel decision up in the last 10 years in that franchise. So I, I very, I don't put any of that on Derek Carr whatsoever. I really don't. Um, Look, I, I, I think you'll be okay with Brock Purdy and Trey Lance, but that's a big chance to take when you have the team that the 49ers do. What happens next year? And let, let's say you are the GM, okay? You say, we're rolling with Brock Purdy and Trey Lance. They're, they're going to be one and one A. Hell, we might shuffle them in and out depending on the situation, and both of them get hurt. And now you've got to scramble around to find a quarterback. And you know that both of them are hurt coming into the season. And you had the opportunity to go get Derek Carr or somebody else. Guess who's getting canned? You. You're getting canned because you had a team that was ready to go to the Super Bowl and you rolled the dice on two extremely unproven commodities when you had somebody you could put in the driver's seat. But we can agree if Derek Carr does come, Trey Lance is gone. You're not keeping Trey Lance as a third quarter. I don't think so, no. Unless yeah. they just no. absolutely can't get anything for Trey Lance on the trade market, and I think they can, right? So, no, I, I think if Carr comes in, or if I don't know who else is out there that you could possibly make a trade for. I, I'm know? just I'm just curious on your take on this person. He's not an option due to his uh, sizable salary, sizable ego, and sizable injury record, but – 
What's your take on Kyler Murray out of curiosity? When you put into a contract that a guy doesn't get paid certain money if he doesn't read the playbook, and then you take it back out because that was a mistake, you put it in there for a reason in the first place. Um, I I don't have anything personally against Kyler Murray. I just haven't seen anything that make me would make me think I want him to be my quarterback. Um he has all the talent in the world, and I just, you know, whether it's Cliff Cliff Kingsbury's system being bad uh, or whatever, it's going to be really interesting this year because I think the Cardinals are going to focus a lot more defensively. They're going to play more conservatively, I think. And whether that benefits Murray or not, I, I don't know. But, you know, is he a guy that I would go out and try and acquire? I, I don't think so, right? Um, you know, Baltimore seems to be in the mood for us uh, to trade Lamar Jackson. I don't think Lamar Jackson is the guy I would go out because I don't think he fits the system. And I, that's the problem is I don't know that Trey Lance actually fits the system that San Francisco wants to run here. Right. The guy who fits that system is Tom Brady. Um, now I uh, do, I think that they would have done well to sign Tom Brady. I don't, I think Don, Tom was done after this year, um, but that's the guy, right? That's the guy you're looking for. Um, you know, this is, this is going to sound crazy, but a guy who I think would fit extremely well, uh, is Teddy Bridgewater. I think Teddy Bridgewater would be a great pickup, um, because he's a quarter, he's a management type quarterback, right? But he has a big, he still has a big enough arm, but he's not a guy who needs to throw the ball 50 times a game. He's not a guy who needs to, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, that specific offense that they run. I think Bridgewater would be great in that offense what about and, Gino, and not what, cost them a lot. What about Geno Smith? He's going to cost too much at this point. I think, yeah, I think you'd be overpaying for Geno Smith. And and I like I'm uh, Geno Smith is a wonderful story. That's fantastic. And I think he's going to have another really good year because he's got the right pieces around him in Seattle, right? And he fits that offense really well. Is he, is he coming back for sure? I thought it was a free agent, but I could be wrong. No, I think he'll, he'll yeah. end up back. So recapping Super Bowl 57, uh, I am uh, a little richer now, thanks to, and I should have put the money on Mahomes. You know, I thought about it afterwards. I'm like, if you're going to bet Casey to win, you might as well just bet on uh, Mahomes being the Super Bowl MVP because he did it on one leg. If they're winning, mm-hmm. as long as he did anything, he's winning the Super Bowl he's MVP, winning, yeah. which he did. And fantastic game. Um, I was up north and missed most of it. <laughs> if the 49ers were in it, I would have watched it. But uh what a shootout watching them uh, trade touchdowns back and forth. Uh, who was your money on at the beginning? Were you surprised at the result and how much did you enjoy that game? Uh, my money was on KC, uh, although I was third in a pool and it was a blind pick. And the person who was winning was one of the guy's wives who was just picking kind of randomly by city. And, uh, so I chose in the pool, I chose Philadelphia, assuming she would take KC because she had been picking by uniform colors and things like that. And I had to pick the opposite. And it turned out we all picked Philadelphia. If I'd have taken KC, I would have won the pool, but oh, well, I'll, I'll live. But I had KC win in the game and I, I was not surprised. Um, uh, again, that, that uh, Bradbury penalty at the end where, I mean, and to his credit, give him credit for coming out and seeing after the game he, he it was a penalty he was holding right he had the guy's jersey he had smith's jersey but it's not a matter of is it's a penalty it's a matter of have you been calling that for the other 59 minutes of the game and if you weren't you can't expect the guy to think okay well this is the one time that you're going to call this at the most crucial juncture in the game right did you know do I think Harrison Butker probably would have kicked the field? Yeah, probably would have been anyway, right? But it's just the idea of, my gosh, don't don't make that call right then, right? Well, are you ready to uh, chisel uh, Mahomes' uh, bust for uh, for uh, Canton? Because, look, uh, I guess I'm the biggest Mahomes fan on, on the planet, and more because just, you know, he, he, I, 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 hearing him, Steph Curry, it's like, I get it. They're amazing. You don't tell me this every <laughs> single day. But you know what? The guy did it. He persevered. He said he was. He did what he said he was going to do. He really led his team. Uh, they played a solid game overall. All the credit in the world to Andy Reid. 
the way they took out the Bengals, it was just, you know, they were methodical. They didn't slip much. And I want to give them the credit that they're due and, you know, good on them and two time winner. And you're ready to write your story now. Like it's one thing when you win one, when you win two, you are in greatness and they are set with him for the next decade, hopefully, and good on him and kudos to Patrick Mahomes. I wonder though, how long let us. So Mahomes has got two now, right? I wonder if it's in Mahomes to stick it out for another decade or whether at some point he just says, you know what, when this contract's over with, I'm done. Right. I mean, I, I think we may be at the point, I mean, where we're, you're going to start seeing some of these guys when they get these huge contracts think, I'm going to play until I'm 32 or 33. And then I've got all, not all the money in the world, but I got a sizable chunk in the bank. Why, why am I going to continue doing this? I, I know there's competitive fire and everything, but you know, multiple concussions will make you stop, ma- make you make a decision that I'm not going to do this anymore. Right. Not that I'm saying that that's happened to Mahomes yet, but it's always a something you have to think about. I don't know if we're going to have many of these guys sticking around for the long term and playing you know, I mean, playing like Brady or Rogers or whatever else, right? I just, I don't think that's going to happen much longer. They call it the Andrew Luck effect, uh-huh. right? When you walk away really early, very unexpected, and he's saying, you know what? I got a young family. I got enough dough in the bank, and it's enough for me. If there's one sport, it's football. Let's yeah. let's be realistic. Compared to every other sport, we love baseball. We love hockey. We love basketball. But football is such a violent sport. No matter how much they take it out of the game, that's still, it's all set up to be sacked and to be tackled. And it's hard. And those guys are big and it is scary. And uh, as soon as you're a little gun shy, I think you're done. Like as soon as you have that one moment of hesitation. So if Mahomes does decide that in the future, remember his dad was an MLB pitcher. He was supposed to be a possibly two way sport player. Why does he just take us up, up some baseball? Why not? Like look, pitcher, pitchers are making forty million a year now. Why does he just do that? Well, I I I wholeheartedly concur with you. I think that there is a t- entire possibility here of a lot of these guys uh, having the chance, you know, uh, to walk away from football at twenty eight, twenty nine. How many tight ends could walk away at twenty eight or twenty nine and go play basketball in the NBA? Right, guys who played in college, right, played basketball in college or whatever else. Um, you know, it goes the other way. You take basketball players, big, you know, big number two forwards, and you turn them into tight ends, and they're very successful in the NFL. It goes both ways. You could have guys walk away and just go, you know what? It's the thing with the NFL is, is that you're not getting to the NFL until you're 22 or 21 if you declare a little early or whatever, right? And you're not getting that big payday until you're 25 or 26. So you've got to sign that deal. And so you're not getting out until you're 31, 32 years old, uh, unless you you know really decide I'm, I'm going to walk away and go do something else. And I think that probably the only sport that that really works for then is, is, is anybody really going to commit uh, to Pat Mahomes at 33 or 34? I think in his situation, yes, because it's an incredible story, right? Uh, could you imagine if he said, I'm retiring, and the next day went and signed with the Royals? Like that, the town would lose their minds, right? What a boon for the Royals, right? So I think that's entirely a uh, that's that's a, that's a crazy possibility, right? But there's a lot of other guys. I think they would be so advanced in their age and career in, in terms of the football age or athletic age that it would just be too late, right? Well, on uh, the chosen journey with Steve Carsey, we had a special guest by the name of Jim the Rookie Morris. We dug up Jim the Rookie Morris. We were just talking about him this weekend. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really cool. I'll have to go back and watch that one. Yes, it was a three-parter and uh, talk about his story. At 35 years old, the oldest uh, rookie, you know, he was the D- Dal- Diamond Dallas Page of MLB. And uh, you know what? Mahomes, considering the training he puts in, and I'm sure he tosses the ball with his dad in the offseason, uh, for him to go be a closer, a one-inning reliever in the future, you know, and dabble in and just make, let's say, a side five, seven million bucks a year for his troubles, why not, you know? And 
you know, even remember when Jordan, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, we won't get into those of why he became a two sport player. There's a lot of folklore about that and the true reasons behind it. But, you know, when Mahomes says, I'm done, what's he going to do? He's going to go broadcasting. Obviously, they could pay them 50 million a year to do that. But if he has that competitive spirit, he's in his early 30s or mid 30s and saying, you know what, I'm going to go to spring training. I can't remember who holds his rights. I feel like it's the Padres or the Mariners for some reason that when he got drafted, and they said, we're going to draft him anyways, even though we know he's going to go into football because we want to hold his rights and see what happens. Look, uh, Oakland's still waiting on Kyler Murray, and he may be going back to Oakland yeah. sooner, <laughs> sooner rather than later. So it'll be quite interesting. But I never thought of Mahomes that way. But you know what? I thought he was going to be a Brady for sure on Montana. He's going to go get as many rings as he can, as many championships. But this generation's a little different. And the money's a lot bigger than right. Montana Steve Young days. Like when you're making $50 million a year, just in one year and you're set for a thousand lifetimes. Let's be honest. So well, and, and I hadn't thought about it from the point of but that is an excellent point. That that so say say Mahomes walks away at 32 or 33, and you know he can he can still bring it at 94 or 95 miles an hour. We're not talking about a, a guy who needs a lot of time to go work things out. You bring him into spring training. And then you send him to triple A or double A and let him work for a month or two and you work mechanics. He could come right onto your roster that year and probably provide you with help. Right. So it's not like it's a guy who's going to take a whole lot of time that to, you know, he already knows how to pitch to a certain extent. And it's not like he doesn't have a coach, somebody who can help him out. Right. So, I, you know, I think that's an ex that's a great thought. And I, I also think that there's the possibility there. I wonder how, if there's actually, somebody in each MLB staff that keeps track of that kind of stuff. Guys who were drafted and then, you know, maybe played college baseball at the same time or high school baseball at a high level, and they, they don't make it in the NFL or whatever else. And I know that the NFL is the wrong body type, unless you're talking about wide receivers or quarterbacks, really, maybe defensive backs, but are out there kind of kicking the tires on those guys and saying, hey, you know what, let's, We'll, we'll pay you a thousand dollars. Let's go down to the local park and bring a gun and see what you throw at. Right. Cause there's gotta be a few guys out there who probably didn't pitch in high school that have that athletic talent that they could probably throw 90 to 92 just naturally. Right. And you work with them for six months and all of a sudden you've got a pitcher, right? Guaranteed there's somebody on that. And especially when the two sport players, they get drafted. They go off to a different sport league. They most of the time, if not all the time, they get invited to spring training. You know, I just come put on the uniform, come pitch in a bullpen session. Okay. I'm sure Mahomes gets that call every single year because it's a lot of publicity. It's great, but it's also, you know, if there's a one percent chance they're gonna do it, they do it. You know, yeah. thinking about Steve Carsey's situation, for example, you know, he has a son Kingston. So Kingston Carsey, can you not hear that as a first round draft pick? It's perfect. <laughs> you know, twelve years old. Steve decides to retire from coaching or pause it. And he is now basically full-time looking after his son when he's not in school, helping him coaching, coaching his baseball team. You know, think about how many advantages this, this kid has now because his dad played professional baseball. Now Kingston it, it doesn't pitch as much. He does pitch, but he's, he wants to be a hitter more than likely. And Steve is pushing him more to be a hitter, which I don't blame him whatsoever as far as the wear and tear on the arm. But, you know, from a young age, imagine from the time he was a baby, he was sitting in major league dugouts. He's been mm -hmm. in the bullpens. He's met everybody. Think about Mahomes growing up and with his dad and getting to see all around the Minnesota camp and being around all the players. Just when you are in, in the, the, you know, like we're being based around Toronto here and how many second generation, third generation players you got, Vladdy, you know, Guerrero, Bo Bichette, you know, Kevin Biggio. When your father, your grandfather, played MLB ball or any sport, you know, and you're growing up in those ranks, there's just, there's an inherent advantage simply because you have that experience, you have that understanding, you have that coaching compared to Joe Schmo off the street that never got to experience that. So. Yeah, there's uh, a couple, I mean, there's a couple of, a, a few facets to that. I mean, the, the first one is obviously the one you're talking about, which is, I don't think people understand quite how much that uh, gives a kid an advantage um, having grown up in the and having an uh, an inherent understanding of this is what it takes, this is what you have to do to play major league ball. These are the kind of things that people want to see from a major league ball player. The second thing is genetics. Obviously, if your dad 
was a major league baseball player, there's a pretty good, you have a much better chance of adding the, having the genetic makeup and the athletic talent to do those things. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think people just, people don't really, you know, the third thing is how much more likely if you're looking at draft picks, let's say you've got a and B and B is Carsey's kid and all things being equal, you know that this kid's dad is Steve Carsey. And Steve's a good guy. Steve would have raised the kid, right? Steve's a known quantity, a uh, commodity, and, and Steve would have coached this kid. Well, who are you going to take? And that 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 is of, for all, you know, people say, well, it seems like there's a lot of hockey guys that their kids play hockey. Yeah, because the hockey community knows that father, and they know that this guy probably was raised for, right, right? And they know that they work the kid hard and they know he's got this kind of that kind of thing. Right. So it's no, again, it's, it's, you take the thing, you know, as the thing you don't know. Right. So it's a pretty huge advantage for sure. Um, that's really interesting. I, what'd you say his first name was Kingston Kingston Carsey. Yeah. It's kind of like Cody Clemens, right? That's right. Or Cody Rhodes. And <laughs> you know, you hear these stories and people think it's folklore. It's not in the, you know, People calling up ex-teammates, ex-coaches, a uh, known buddy, and they say, listen, we're thinking about drafting this person. We're thinking about hiring this person as your coach. I know you've worked with them before. What's your take on them? That is real. That is out there. Uh, and you know, someone like Steve is highly respected in the community for having pitched in, in baseball for as long as he did. Plus, considering uh, his coaching ranks, he did it the right <laughs> way. He came up in the minors in the Cleveland system and low ball worked his way up then and then became a bullpen coach for the Brewers. So he's seen all levels of coaching as well. That's a resource. If somebody knows him, they'll definitely pick his brain and he has that kind of respect. So of course, knowing his son as well, I agree with you full heartedly that that's uh, it definitely helps. And uh, looking forward to hopefully Kingston Carsey making his uh, getting drafted and everything else. But for now he's 12 and we'll let him enjoy uh, sports and see where it goes. Now's the time, John, to jump in and sign into an exclusive autograph and memorabilia deal. And I can give <laughs> and and I can give him fifty thousand dollars right now. And all he's got to do is give me twenty percent of his lifetime earnings. Yeah, exactly, hundred percent right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on our last two topics of today, I want to play a little game with you, Wayne. It's called players I want and players I don't want. And there's a okay. categories and why. So would you rather go into the topics of players I want or players I don't want? Let's do players I don't want. Wayne will take players I don't want for 200. The answer is Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. I'm split. The question I want is, I want Kyrie Irving. Well, what is the question? I I I think the question is how strong is your locker room and how how willing are you to, if it totally falls apart, are you willing to move on from him and take a huge loss in your investment? That's the thing to me, right? Why um, does anybody want these players is the answer. <laughs> because Kyrie Irving has an incredible amount of talent. And he's not a stupid guy either, right? He he may be foolish, but he's not stupid. A right? little bit of knowledge is very scary, absolutely. Yes, that's that's true, right? Yes. Um, I, I don't really understand Kevin Durant any longer. I I, I mean, he's still he's still a good player, but eh, whatever. I, you know, I, I just don't I don't see it. But Irving is young enough to me that if he settles somewhere and you put him with the right guy, and you have that one two punch, and who knows if this is the right guy or not, um. You have five or ten years of incredible one-two punch coming, right? Um, can you can can? And the other thing is too: Do you have another personality in the locker room strong enough to handle him? Right? Can you deal with all the the BS that might come up? I don't know. Uh, is there a point where Kyrie Irving is no longer going to create a distraction? I don't believe that, but it's possible, I guess. Wayne, I could fix this. If I, I don't know what the, who the representation are, and I'm not going to try to step on their toes, but if they want the chosen lawyer and they want assistance in this, I can go become a sports agent for either of those individuals, 
And we're going to sit down. We're going to make some very clear things. Number one, you are off social media altogether. You can be on social media, but there's going to be somebody managing it. They are as vanilla apple pie as you get and very bland. Uh, there'll be nothing more than had a great game. Really appreciate the fans. Here's doing some charity work. That's all we're doing. Number two, here's your 20 lines. These are all the things you're ever going to say to the public or to the media. You're going to say nothing else. There's no I in team, one game at a time. You know, it's a team effort, you know, tried our best, blah, 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 blah. Because these people are given a smartphone and are allowed to do their own tweets, and then they're allowed to go say whatever they want that's on their minds, this is the problem. I really want them off doing yoga, meditation. I want them to get it all out of their system there and come back relaxed, focused, and just follow the script. They'd be. I know it's a lot more boring and fans don't enjoy that, but they'll be much better for it in their careers because I don't understand how these guys shove their boots into their mouths all the time and look so silly. Like they're. You're, you're right. They're so talented. The KD should be in the conversation of one of the best ever. Yet all we're talking about is how annoyed we are with him, and that's a shame. I appreciate the fact, and I'm certainly not going to be the guy to say that Kyrie Irving or or whoever doesn't have the right to say whatever they want to say, right? Um, I'm not even going to say in some instances that I don't I, I I disagree with Kyrie Irving about some things that Kyrie Irving has said, but it makes your life. I guess the thing that annoys me the most about it is who? Why do you, Kyrie Irving, think I give two wits? about what you think you know it's not like you're some grand philosopher who is up on the mountain that i should listen to your wisdom um you're just some dude just like everybody else and your opinion is your opinion and i'm i I, whatever your opinion is i don't honestly i'm one of these guys i don't think there should be any limits on free speech whatsoever the reason is because i want to know who you are so if you want to tell me that you're a racist or you want to tell me you're anti-Semitic, if you want to tell me this or that, tell me. Because that just means to me, I don't want anything to do with you. I want to know who you are. That's all. And you want to be that guy? Be that guy. I don't have to be involved with you, right? So go ahead and say whatever you're going to say. It's more about why do you think that we should be listening to you? Why do you think that You want to make pronouncements about uh, this is what kind of drives me nuts about LeBron James, right? You want to make pronouncements about things that you don't know a damned thing about, right? I know I'm more educated about most of the things that LeBron talks about than LeBron is. Why do you think we care what you think, right? All you're doing is opening yourself up to, and go ahead and share the opinion if you want to share, but don't be shocked when a bunch of other people go, not only are you probably wrong, but you don't have any idea what you're talking about, right? And then you want to be upset for people calling you out. Well, you put your opinion out there. So that's what my real problem is, is that I agree with you. Somebody needs to be in Kyrie's ear or LeBron's ear or whoever's ear it is. And that doesn't just apply to athletes. You can apply it to yourself before you send a tweet out. I do the same thing all the time. I am not active really on Twitter any longer because I just open it up and it makes me mad. Um, I don't pay a post a lot on Facebook anymore. I just kind of look at it and I'll post something about my wife or something like that. But my rule now is if you're going to tweet something, let it sit there for 15 or 20 seconds. And I think Elliot Friedman has the same rule from 32 thoughts. And I look at it again and go, nah, no, I'm just not going to post that. Right. Because last night, I, somebody sent me a little image of Dr. Fauci and it was a Valentine and it said, you make my heart stop. Now, you know, my feelings about this. Um, I, I'm not vaccinated. I did never get vaccinated. Okay. And I have my own thoughts about that. And you can talk to me about them if you wish, but what the hell does my opinion mean? I'm not a doctor, but I thought that's funny. I'm going to reach, I'm going to, I'm going to send that out to some of my friends. And I put it up and I looked at it and I thought, what am I accomplishing by doing this? A couple people I know will laugh and a whole bunch of people will be either offended or come at me about things that we really don't need to talk about. My decision doesn't affect you. Your decision doesn't affect me. 
So why the hell are we putting it out there? Right? Let it go. Let it go. And that's what I would say to Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant and LeBron James and a lot of these guys. Just look at that thing again and go, you know what? Delete and let it go. And I'm going to go sit in my hot tub with a bottle of Hennessy and some jazz on and just close my eyes for 10 minutes and think happy thoughts. And then it's, we don't need to worry about that. And I got to put a little disclaimer in that. I agree. I agree with parts of what you said there is uh, openly and uh, saying that, uh, you know, as far as limits on free speech and the scariness of that. But the reality is, and I was thinking a lot about in celebrities, not just in basketball players, you know, you could talking about musicians and actors, but, even you know when I sit with my lawyers in our office and any professional, you know, as a lawyer, I counsel them and I tell them, look, we're in a society now that's awake, sleep. I don't know which one's awake, which one's asleep, doesn't matter. But we're in a day and age that, you know, we're fighting for free speech, yet you can't really say anything because anything you're going to say, you're going to get bombasted for, you know, and it's just not a good way to go. So the easiest thing is to stay politically correct and just pretty much say nothing. Like, you know, when I post on my social media, pictures of my dog, pictures of me eating, uh, pictures of me at seminars, that's life is easy that way. They're not going mm -hmm. into anything contentious because don't need to have an opinion. No, we need to know my opinion. And you're going to create insight, people liking you this way and hating you this way and all sorts of dialogue that doesn't need to be there. So we need to keep that stuff away here. We can talk about it as far as on a podcast side. On the same token, even I have limits of how much we get to pod podcast wise because, you know, with censorship, you don't want it, the episode taken down. You don't want people getting upset. This is where we are in life. So, Kyrie, you know, Nike's gone now. You know, Kanye, Adidas mm -hmm. is gone. Adidas is gone now. Open your eyes. That's a big loss and it didn't need to go this way. People right. love the Kyrie shoes. All you have to do is, hey, I got the Kyrie shoes. I'm loving up. These shoes are pieces of garbage and I hate being my name attached to them. <laughs> so now, now I will say though, yes. While I find it, unless Kyrie returned all the money, which I doubt very seriously happened, no. but I, I can, I can respect somebody who maybe signed a deal and then maybe was sold a bill of goods about the quality of something that he was going to be attached to. But at that point, you're you're free to come out and say, hey, I'm not happy with this because blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, you better have returned all the money that you got in the deal, right? Wayne, if they give me a $100 million shoe deal and it's a bunch of cardboard with masking tape, I do not care at that point. I'll endorse them, okay? <laughs> so going from players we don't want, the players we do want, as we end up today's topic, because you – Asked for this one mm -hmm. and, you know, got to keep the promises. In the world of the NHL, they're still waiting for all this trade speculation. There's a whole new category of did not play for trade reasons. There's a new category the NHL has created, which will be seen across all sports. So the shoes have fallen so far in Bo Horvat and Vladimir Tarasenko. So interesting pieces going to the Islanders and the Rangers. They're both off to New York. What do you think of those deals? And uh, are we going to see a lot of movement uh, come this deadline in the NHL? So Horvat, that's a great trade um, for the for the Islanders because they had to do they had to go get something right. They had to pick somebody up, and I really like Bo Horvat. The Islanders, I mean, already they're chanting his name at Nassau Coliseum, right? That's fantastic. Uh, I think that's a really good deal for both teams. It sucks for Vancouver to lose Horvat, but it is what it is, right? I have some, being from St. Louis, I have some people in some contacts inside the Blues organization. And I can tell you that the Tarasenko deal, they got probably more than they should have. Because you're talking about, a, they haven't been happy with Tarasenko for two years. Right. And Tarasenko hasn't been happy there for two years. And everybody knew that he was leaving one way or the other. So for them to get back, even what will end up being a bottom of the first round pick and Sammy Blaze, who I, I like Sammy Blaze, but, you know, and, and is a known quantity then because he played in St. Louis before. But the Rangers basically had to go out 
and do something because the Islanders signed Horvath. And so now you've got Tarasenko to the Rangers. You've got Horvath to the Islanders. Does that mean Timo Meyer to the Devils? Or are they going out? Because they, they're the third piece in, in the New York area. They got to go do something too. And they're very good, right? So is it possible there? Now, uh, they were talking recently a little more about the possibility that could the Leafs be in the mix for Timo Meyer? He's an RFA and he has a qualifier for $10 million next year. And then he could walk, right? I am of a mind that I don't really think what the Ma- I don't care what the Maple Leafs do going in at the deadline. Uh, they're they're going to lose in the first round again. They're uh, they're not a very good team. Everybody keeps telling me, "Oh, look how good they are!" Really, they're not that good. They're above average. But if you have to go play Tampa or Boston in the first round, so you're going to go out and again blow assets in the classic Maple Leafs tradition. To acquire somebody now, if you if you could if you if you think there's a way that you can sign Timo Meyer or you can get Timo Meyer, and then he considers you a contender and you can go, let's say eight at eight and a half, and you can sign him for eight years. Okay, that that's different, right? You're acquiring somebody for the long stretch, right? But this discussion of we're going to go get somebody to help us in the, you know, in the short term. What's the line in Slapshot? Is the when they say who's who's going to take us? Dave's Dave's a mess and he's not playing, but he's going to take his place. And the the star who's uh, Michael Anki and I can't remember his name in the movie says, "Is the answer Jesus?" That's really the only guy I think you could sign here who's going to put the Leafs over the top. There's not anybody else out there. You want to go get Luke Shen because he's a he's a he's not going to be that expensive, and he leads the league in hits. Okay. That makes sense to me, right? He's going to play on your third, or second, or third pairing, and he brings some of the things that the Leafs lack. But aside from that, this team is not one person away from beating Tampa or beating Boston. And if you're not one person away, don't go blow another first round pick and a high end prospect to get a rental and then get your butt handed to you in the first round again. That's not how this should work. That's not how you build a winning team. You right now have, what, four or five incredible pieces and a bunch of other stuff. And the last two or three years have proven that doesn't work when you go to the playoffs. So maybe, Kyle, change. Go in a different direction. Wayne, we have our uh, other uh, resident... uh... Maple Leaf hockey expert Zachary Rain of Rain Finance, and uh, you know he tells us every uh, month about how the Leafs are going to be going to the Stanley Cup. When we get closer to the NHL playoff time, I would love to have both of you on to introduce first of all, <laughs> and love to hear the hockey discussion. Uh, this would be a lot of fun, trust me. I just it's it's hard for me to look at, and this is maybe something when you have him on, you can ask him. You have Matthews, you have Marner, you have Nylander, you have Tavares, you have Morgan Riley. That's a pretty good core. Why doesn't it work? And work means advance past the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Work is not be amazing in the offseason and score 50 or 60 goals and be entertaining. Work is succeed when it counts. This team does not do that. This team does not scare anybody like who if you're some other team and you're gonna let's say that you're making it you've already advanced to the second round of the playoffs and you're gonna play the winner of boston and and toronto or tampa bay and toronto who do you hope wins i guarantee you they're all sitting around rooting for toronto to win because they're soft and they're not very good defensively and frankly they're not that great in the net either i don't have any problem with what dubas did this year for the goalie situation, he gambled and Samsonov has been pretty damn good in front of in, in behind a terrible defensive team, really. Um, but again, Samsonov doesn't scare anybody. You don't look at that roster and go, well, he's gonna be the guy who's gonna, you know, pull pull a series out. When are you gonna go get that guy? So let me ask you this, Wayne. 
Linus Allmark, the way he's playing right now in Boston, you take Linus Allmark and you put him in the Toronto Maple Leafs net with the same defensive pairings that Toronto has, is Linus Allmark still playing the same way he is? No. Nobody ever plays the same way uh, going to play behind the Toronto, the team. And, and part of it is, it's it's not even really that the defensive core is bad. It's that they're soft. I mean, you got to have a guy like Luke Shen who is going to come in and when you're Linus, yes, exactly. That's exactly it. I'm going to park my butt in front of Sam Sonoff and wiggle it around and block him. And I need Luke Shen to come in and put the wood to that dude in the back. And I don't care if he gets the two minute penalty for it. The message is you can't stand in front of our goalie like that. Like you're Sean Avery dancing around blocking Martin, Martin Brodeur, right? We're not going to let that, we're not going to let you get away with that. And when you get in somebody's face in our team, you know, the face of the team is not going to be Austin Matthews laughing and smiling while somebody gets roughed up on the other side of the ice. The, the face is going to be Luke Shen coming in and stapling your ass into the glass and taking a major for boarding, right? That's the way that's going to work from here on out. This team, I was discussing this with somebody the other day. This team over the last 10 years has had four or five guys that have had exactly what the team needed. And they weren't able to put the team over the top by doing this. But we had Leo Komarov. Oh, Leo doesn't skate well enough. We got to get rid of him. We have Matt Martin. Oh, Matt doesn't score enough. We got to get rid of him. And then you get rid of those guys. Boy, I wish we had a guy like Leo Komarov. Then we had we had Nazem Kadri. And everybody's like, oh, he's unreliable in the playoffs. And what does he do? He goes somewhere else and wins a cup and is amazing, right? And everybody says, man, I wish we had a guy like Nazem Kadri. Stop trading that guy. Yeah, but we had You've Tyson. you got to keep that dude. But we had Tyson Berry. Look, I, we have uh, <laughs> the guy that they picked up, the Dryden Hunt guy that they picked up in the trade. I like that guy. That's a good guy to have around. But he's a marginal guy. The same way Luke Shen is going to be a marginal guy. I mean, Luke's at the end of his career, but he's a good guy to bring in for a playoff run. That's great. The Connor Timmons deal that they did, where they re-signed him for two years, fantastic. It's a great deal. You know, you're talking about guys being healthy scratches. How many times are they going to report that Chickering's coming to either here or Boston? I mean, it sounds like it's down to one of those two teams, but they keep saying, "Oh, the deal's done. It's Toronto." No, it's not. It's Boston. It's no, it's not. It's Toronto. And he's just sitting there going. Just trade me. I just want to play, right? And what are the Leafs going to give up for that guy? I don't have a problem with them acquiring Chikrin, right? That's a guy that you keep going forward. What you Matthew keep, it, he's around, right? Huh? Matthew, Matthew Nice. I know, Matthew, I know. It's I know. Matthew Nice. So one team we have to touch upon as we're ending today's episode. We've gone a little over today, but you know what? It's been great discussion because too many topics and so much heated the debate on this is uh, Blackhawks are sitting on a lot of pieces right now. They have a lot of phone calls. Four pieces I'm thinking of. You know who they are. Uh, are they moving everybody, and where are they going? Well, the Tarasenko trade to the Rangers really screws things up for Patrick Kane because I think that's where Kane wanted to go, and I think the Rangers probably would have been very interested, and I don't think even Kane's asking price is going to be that high, right? But now, who is out there that can give the, uh, give the Blackhawks something, right, that – Kane is interested in playing for, right? Like he's very much in control of his own situation as he should be. It's negotiated, right? Right. But aside from the Rangers, the only other name that I've heard was Toronto. And do you give up anything for Patrick Kane down the stretch? Does he really help that much if you're Toronto? I don't know. Right. Um, Taves. I hate to see that deal happen. I think it will, although he was out for a day or two with some sort of non-COVID illness. Um, hopefully that's not like a bronchial infection or something else that keeps him out for a couple of weeks. But there are big questions for both of those guys for their health, and especially like with Kane. If you plan on making a big run in the playoffs, I, I believe that uh, Elliot Friedman talked about this the other day. Let, let's say, I think they brought up Dallas as a possibility. And Dallas, he would play well with Siler Sagan, right? But is he going to last if you get all the way to the Stanley Cup? Will he make it all the way to the Stanley Cup? How useful is he going to be to you down the stretch? 
I don't know. I mean, if I was the Leafs, I don't think, unless it was ridiculously cheap, I don't think I would be in on it there uh, in that deal. And I. What about the I don't know. Are they moving? I think they are definitely moving. I don't think the Leafs are involved in any of that. I think they are going. I think pretty much everything that's not nailed down in Chicago is going, right? I don't think they have much of a choice. Um, and why? Why not move those guys? You know, I, I don't think there's any real reason. Chicago has a pretty pretty solid farm system too, right? And it's time to play some dudes, right? Bring some of those guys up. Um, so I think I think – they're, all of those guys are gone. It's just a matter of Chicago is in a in an awkward situation with Kane and with Taves now with injuries and especially with Kane. I'm sure Chicago thought he's just going to the Rangers and we'll get what we get. And and now, now it's kind of a struggle, right? What about the Sabers? Go home. You can always go home. I don't think Kane has any interest going anywhere where they're not an immediate contender. Mm. I mean that would be a nice story and everything, but I don't think, I don't think that's. And the other thing is too, you know, Kevin Adams in in Buffalo just locked up uh, Dylan Cousins. They have Darlene coming up. Uh, they just they re-signed uh, who's the other guy that I'm missing there. They just signed somebody else not too long ago to a long extension. Also, a couple guys. They don't have the money laying around to fool with that, and you know. I don't know much about Patrick Kane in terms of his locker room, but is he the veteran you bring in to lead the young guys? I, I don't know if that's the case or not. Well, see where he ends up, Wayne. we will know soon enough. It's been a very, very informative episode today. We covered a lot of ground in the world of sports, memorabilia, life. Really appreciate you sharing the wisdom as always and with the viewers and again, reaching Wayne Frazier. If you want to talk about today's episode, any questions, comments, love, hate for Wayne, please share with him at Doug Lowry Sports. Uh, check out the memorabilia, sports cards in Doug Lowry Sports, their online store, in-store in Barrie. Uh, wh which mall are you located at again? We're in the Kozlov Center, which is right off of 400, a little bit north on Bayfield Street. When you're coming up, you'll see that the that's the same mall that has the Talese and the Metro in it. It's www.douglauriesports.com. And yes, that is the store that used to be at Maple Leaf Gardens in the 60s and 70s. Um, and you can follow us at Doug Laurie Sport on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. And our auction site is Doug Laurie Auctions. And we run auctions once every two weeks generally. So, And when you're driving up to the cottage, cottage season's coming up very shortly. Great stop off. Uh, grab a bite to eat. Look at some memorabilia. Talk to Wayne. Talk some sports, and you're all set to go. And we do also uh, host monthly shows here in the mall. So if you check out our schedule, I don't know when this podcast will release, but the next one is the 24th and 25th. But people always say, well, how do you do a show in here? You've got so much stuff in the store. We have 40 to 50 tables of vendors who come for a Friday and Saturday uh, once a month. And we have some pretty incredible stuff, some pretty high-end stuff. I know we've had people who said, I don't know if I want to drive all the way up from Toronto because I don't know if anybody will have any anything I want. And they end up spending some pretty serious coin with the vendors out here, right? So we have a bunch of really the nice thing is is that, you know, when you do a community show and you're talking about a big a big show at a like a, a hall or something like that, and say they maybe have 60 to 80 tables of vendors or whatever, they're kind of from all over the place and it's just whoever shows up. My vendors are kind of curated in the sense that if I, somebody comes in and they're a new vendor and I don't like them, they don't come back, right? So we have a big, big hall full of honest, good guys who will talk to you about the hobby, honestly, make fair offers on your stuff if I'm not interested in it, and give you good information too. I wouldn't bring them in under my banner if I didn't believe in what they were doing, right? So there you go, folks. Well, that's Wayne Frazier, Wayne Frazier Jr., of Doug Lorry Sports. Thank you again, Wayne. We'll see you back real soon on The Chosen Life. And as we end off, you know, we do the flex, right? And you got say, it. And we say keep living the chosen life. You got it. Cheers.